The following interview was conducted with Barbara Ann Hansen, a retiree from the Office of Admissions at Purdue University for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, April 22, 2009, at a residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Barbara, and good Thank afternoon. You. Tell us a little bit about where and when you were born and your parents and siblings. I uh, was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, my parents were Otto and Esther Hansen. I do not have any brothers and sisters. Uh, my father was a draftsman. My mother was a nurse. Um, and probably because I was an only child, uh, chances are I was spoiled, although I thought it was wonderful at the time. Now I would like to have brothers and sisters, but not then. Um, Graduated from high school. And well, tell us school. about your early years, and tell us about high school activity or organizations. And oh, dear. Who can, who can remember? <laughs> uh, went to elementary school and high, junior high and high school in Grand Rapids. Um, always had done well academically. Um, and as a, again, as a child, you know, I had the piano lessons and the dance lessons and the swimming lessons and tennis lessons and all that good stuff all that good stuff right. and, and again probably because partly because I was an only child and certainly not because my parents had any money my father was my father had a bad back and so when I was uh, I don't know two or three I guess he was he was not working for a year because of his back and this was also depression time so that yeah. didn't help anybody. So when, when I was three, my mother went back to work. Mother was not working, you know, the first two, three years of my life. Went back as a nurse and, and worked. And Did she work in a hospital? She, uh, she did work on the staff of a hospital for a while, but she didn't really care very much for that. So most of her nursing career uh, was spent doing private duty nurses on a one-to-one -one Sure. basis she much preferred that where she could actually do the c actual care she didn't like the administrative or the you know six patients or ten patients or whatever you would have had uh, my father did go back to work after a year or so um, but his he always seemed to be working for companies that failed you know so he would work and then he'd be off not for any great yeah. length of time but sure. whatever some gaps. but she as a nurse could work all the time um, and doing private duty nursing meant she worked seven days a week right. and as much as she wanted but of course if she didn't work she wasn't getting paid right. either was she with an agency a lot of those people are uh, with agencies. they had a registry in Grand Rapids <clears throat> so she would register you know sure. like okay here I, I'm ready to go back to work is that, that where not? you get clients then? yeah and, and so the people would call that and say I need a nurse and and then mother could would have the option to either take or not take the job. In most cases, she did, and and really met some. Uh, I didn't meet them necessarily. We didn't as a family, but she really met some very nice people okay. because again, people that were having private duty nurses um, were those that typically could, had little money or could pay for it. Could pay for it, you know. So she would be in the hospital, or a patient would go home. She'd go home with them. Uh, and usually worked from seven to three, so she was usually home by between three and four when I would be out of school, uh, but was not there. Well, in, in elementary school, there she would have somebody working in the house to help her with some of the housework and some of that, so that there would be somebody there at noon when I came home uh, at, at lunchtime. Uh, but then in high school, you can take her I could do her, you know, or middle or junior high. Sure. Could take care of myself in that sense. Or didn't come home for lunch because it was too far. Uh, How large was your high school? Was it a good uh, class? There were, I think, in my high school class, 220 students. So it was a reasonably. Was uh, it a four year? Yeah, it, it, I went through six. Oh, you went through from junior I went high? through you know, kindergarten through sixth grade in elementary school, and then I went through uh, seven, eight, and nine in a junior high school. The high school actually was nine, ten, eleven, and twelve, but I had, there were a couple junior highs in Grand Rapids, and, and where we lived, the path was sure. to go that way. Um, so I was in junior high for those, for three years, and then ten, eleven, and twelve in the in the high school. And I was a my birthday is in December, so 
So I would have graduated from, could have graduated from high school in December. Well, I didn't want to start college in, in, the, in January, in the middle of the year. So I stayed around that extra half semester and took, you know, a few more classes. In high school. In high school, and so I could graduate. And there were a couple of people, I think, in my class that doubled up and graduated early, but most people either stayed or... I suppose some of them started college in sure. January, but that just that it didn't make out. that didn't sound good to me at that yeah. point in time. I thought everybody's starting in the fall. I don't want to start in the middle of the year. Sure. Um, well, I don't remember what I did in high school. Any any student clubs that you remember you were participating? Any uh, gym or anything of that sort? Um, there was a Y teens group that we had, um, and I was in that. Um, and I'm sure there were other things, but sure. <laughs> you went to some of the uh, yeah football games. And yeah, and oh, I went to football basketball games and basketball Athletics, games. You know, yeah, exactly. all that kind of stuff. Not sure. women, not girls, but no, you know, all the boys. Yeah, right. all the boys stuff. Um, then I went to uh, where did you go to college? University of Michigan. How did you happen to select that? Because um, I lived in Michigan, so it was probably either going to be Michigan State or Michigan. Now, why why I gave up on you know Western Michigan or I don't think I ever even considered any private schools. It was either going to be Michigan or Michigan State. It probably would have been Michigan State. I had applied to for scholarships at both places, and the Michigan State scholarship came through. Mich- I mean, what I say, Michigan scholarship came through. Michigan State put me on a waiting list. Well, that meant I was going to go to Michigan. Right. Which I think is what my father wanted anyway. He had not gone to college, so I think he... But his brother had gone to University of Michigan to law school there. And so I think that... There were some... That, I, think he, I think he wanted me to do that anyway. Uh, he never said that. He never, you know, pushed that or whatever. Yeah. Well, of course, after I'd accepted Michigan, then Michigan State came through with one too, but I, I figured, well, I'd already committed. Yeah. Now I know I didn't have to do that, but at the time it... That sort of thing. I already you know, made my commitment. I'm not going to pull that's back. That's right. I'm not going to pull back. So um, so I went to Michigan. So tell us about college. Uh, do you live in a dorm? I lived in, a, right, lived in a dorm for, for really all four years. Lived in a dorm, which they have just now, within the last couple of years, remodeled at Michigan. Um, Michigan had a series of women's halls up up on a hill near the hospital. They've just redone all of those and redone dining halls like they've looked at Purdue's dining halls and they've just basically redone the these. halls and, and and I've not been up there, I've just seen the pictures sure. and so on. Lived in, in Mosier Hall for the first two years and then moved to Martha Cook, which was an upper class, not really an honors residence hall, but you had to apply, and they, some mysterious way, had to figure out. Yes, you would not cause a ruckus here or something. I don't yes, know. Our, you you, know, criteria. Whatever that criteria was, Lord only knows. I think one of the, uh, the only thing that I'm that I'm kind of aware that had to be true uh, is that you had to have pretty good grades because typically that hall always had the highest grade point average. So that, <laughs> we don't spoil our record. That's right. So, we established we want to right. continue yeah, on with it. Yeah, yeah so, uh, so I lived in Martha Cook. Um, and there again, I was on committees, and, sure. you know, they had, and they still to this you day. You big house up there. <laughs> yeah, they still to this day have, like, Friday teas, and, and it was one where everybody had dinner. You went through a cafeteria, but you all, you know, sat down and had dinner, and you did not leave until the house mother was finished with her dinner and got up and left, and then you could leave. And, you know, it was a, a little different than just a regular residence sure. hall. They were all certainly much more different than they are That's right. nowadays, much more. I mean, we were supposed to wear... You got dressed. Uh, yeah, we were supposed to wear well, heels and hose. The, the same thing, the same thing. You know, right. you know they were quite different. Uh, had Christmas breakfast kind of things and would carol through the halls and uh, a lot you know, of activities like a lot that. of activities that they like used that. to have here one time yes and they don't do it this when I look at pictures old pictures of Purdue in the halls I think oh yeah that stuff was going on sure. where I was too I was at Michigan uh still living in Mosher's that had to be the first two years I 
I graduated from high school in 51, so it had to be 52, 53 when the panty raids came through. I mean, you know, Michigan was the first oh, first okay. big panty raid. And we made, you know, Look Magazine, all these magazines. <laughs> Life Magazine. Right? I think at some place, some place in my stuff, there probably are some snapshots because I think we finally got the cameras out and said, oh, my God, there's guys down the hall here, <laughs> you know. Gotcha. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good thing. I mean, we forget about that. We didn't, I, yeah, we didn't, uh, we didn't participate in the sense that we were just in the hall looking out, and then some kids, some of the fellows, did run through our halls, didn't bother us or anything, yeah. you know. But we didn't go out after them and chase them because they went through several residence halls and so on. But it was big stuff oh, at the big time. Stuff, yeah, big I stuff. I can't remember at the time. hearing about that. Right. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. What was your What was your major in college? <clears throat> uh, my major was Spanish. Uh, and then I got a teaching certificate with it. I was basically a liberal arts sure, person. Right. Um, and then when I finally had to decide something, got to do something there, it was like, okay, I'll do uh, Spanish. Spanish right. uh -huh. um, what, then what, what, you know, after graduation, what came next? Um, Did you, do, you, you have some graduate education. You have a master's I, and PhD. I do, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I taught school um, in Grand, well, right outside Grand Rapids at Godwin Heights, which is you know, just suburb, right? Indus and a blue collar industrial kind of suburb uh, of Grand Rapids. I taught there for 11 years. And while I was doing that, um, Michigan had um, extension classes in Grand Rapids. So that after I had taught for a couple years or a year or so, then I started taking classes at night. You know, you could take sure. like a 4.30 or five o'clock class, what it was, you could take a seven thirty, eight o'clock class. So you could take a couple classes every semester. You had to, to, to get the master's degree, you still had to go back on campus, I forgot whether it was one or two semesters or summer school or something. You had to you couldn't yeah, do it yeah. you couldn't do it all in Grand Rapids. Yeah. You had to be some in, had to be in residence. Yeah, some, some had some to be sort. there. Yeah. Uh, and I so I think I was back maybe well I know I was back at least probably at least two summers. Um but but I was always working, not in the summertime, but sure. the rest Were of the time. Were you teaching Spanish? Uh -huh. No, oh. initially, no. Mm -hmm. I was teaching junior high okay. English and history and okay. whatever. And then eventually Spanish. Mm -hmm. But there was somebody else. I don't remember who, but somebody else was teaching Spanish, not me. <laughs> um, but then eventually did that. But, and so I got my, my bachelor's degree in 55, and then my master's degree in 59, and it was in education, secondary education. Um, and, then, and then that was the time that Sputnik was... Going up, yeah. Went up. And so in, must have been 63 or 64 in the summer, I went to one of these NDEA institutes in Spanish at Knox College in Illinois. And then the next summer, I came here to Purdue for an NDEA Counseling and Guidance Institute, whatever whatever year that was, sixty four or so, um, where the you know the government was essentially paying you yeah, to, that to was, do those. those. Were very good. Others they I were, talked to. Have been very they were excellent. They were excellent programs. Right. Yeah, paid uh -huh. yeah. very well. Paid paid well, sure. and you got you know good work. And while I was here. Um, this has been during the summer. Here, yeah. Uh -huh. okay. Well, I came here for that summer. Um, Dr. Scherzer, Bruce Scherzer, um, had said to me I should go ahead and get a Ph.D. Well, I'd already heard that from people at Michigan uh, as I was taking some of these other classes because I had I had taken more classes after I finished my master's. I was still taking sure. classes, um, and I'd heard it from them too, but nothing had really pushed me. Well. Dr. Scherzer said, you know, just stay on here. And well, you know, I wasn't comfortable in August telling him in September I'm not coming back oh, to, you know, to teach. teach. Plus I wasn't sure I wanted to do it anyway. Um, so I went back and taught for one more year and then took, essentially took a leave of absence. Although my sus suspicion was I was never gonna go back, but, but I technically I took that leave and came back here then and I guess it would have been the fall of 
I don't know, 66, 65, 66. Okay. There's something I read. You got your uh, my, about 70. Got 70 your is when I got my PhD, yeah. Okay. And, and the, when I was back, um, well, I came in the summertime, I guess, and and then I was an intern with, with the NDEA Institute then that next year. But then in the fall, I was an, an intern in the Office of Admissions. The student personnel at, at Purdue at that time in the, in the graduate area had interns in financial aid and placement and dean of, St- dean of men, dean of women, registrar. They had 10 or 11 of us out. And the idea was that you were going to do it for two, three years and that you would move from area to area so you would experience two or three different areas. And something in student services. Yes, right, and then go on. Well, I didn't do that. I, I was in admissions for the first year, and at that point I had finished all my classwork because I'd come in with extra hours anyway, so I didn't have any more classes to take. And so Harlan White had said, who was the director of admissions at that point, said, you know, do you want a job? I, oh, okay. <laughs> and so I never left. <laughs> Uh, you start well. You, you finished, and then you just stayed on. In the well, I, I I really hadn't finished the degree at that point. I finished the classes. I still right. had to write the thesis. Sure. Right. So I had started working in '67. I guess was when I was yeah, really course, yeah, technically probably. drawing a real paycheck from down here. I didn't actually finish the degree, and I think January of 1970 is what it says in my. I looked at my thesis last night for the first time, and. <laughs> Here's. Oh, sure, I got a couple of copies. Yeah, um, it looks pretty yellow. But. We have the you know the first thesis at Purdue was 1876, yeah. and I we had a, I had a copy made, and then I used to bring it when we used to do those exhibits uh-huh, for the president's uh-huh, count before uh-huh. the game. Yeah. And one time I didn't bring it, and somebody who had seen it uh-huh. was kind of you know I uh-huh. said, well, I decided not to bring it. Uh, we had to put in one of those plastic and yeah, sand uh-huh, it, but uh-huh. we had that copy made so I could use it. But um, the person that was working there said, "I think you sh- that'll protect the paper uh-huh, because and yeah. the paper was in pretty good shape, yeah, you know. Uh-huh, but it was uh-huh. sort of local. I mean, because he opened it, ended up opening a beer company. Yeah, and <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah, so it was really everybody. That's kind of like yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. Well, tell us about your work in the admissions. Um, when you first started, when working. I first started, um, it was Harland White was the director. And then Sterling Shaw, Charlie Henry, and Roy Nago were the other three people in the admissions office. Where were you located? Then? We were in Hub, well, what's now Hub, the executive building at okay, that time. So. Yeah. Um, and Harlan had had really done an interesting job because those three fellows were very different personalities. They all they worked together very. The four of them worked together very well, but they were very different. Individuals. Individuals. And they played in, you know, different roles and within the office and within the state and so on. Harland at, at that point was certainly known throughout the country, was a had been already president of the you know, the National Admissions Association and sure. so on, and so was well known. And and these people had all been in education in Indiana, so they'd all they knew principals and Con- they, had a lot of they had a lot of contacts already. Um, when I start, when I started, I was. Uh, I don't. Did you know Ann Redmond when she was here? Well, Ann had worked in the dean of students' office as a black lady. Was also getting a PhD, but that w- again was a time when all colleges, Purdue included, was beginning to put more emphasis on recruiting minorities and yeah. so on. Well, you can't do that without some minority staff someplace along the line. Yeah. So Anne and I really kind of started in the admissions office, you know, the, potentially at the same time. Um, first two women who had ever worked prof- as professionals, there were, you know, all the oh, clerks and secretaries, all women, but sure. but we were the first two and she was in the same class type. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. And she too was working on a PhD. Did you have student help in there too at that time? Uh, I, there were a few students. There, not very really many. Not okay. partly because that they can't do a lot with. They didn't want them doing things with student records. Right. That's kind of. Right. They could do some mail things and they could do some things, but but yeah, not but the records is different. But sure. the records gets a little right. trickier, at least. At, 
at least they've perceived it as tricky. Yeah, <laughs> Who knows? <exactly. laughs> yeah. Um, and when I first started, they, uh, well, they still do, I guess. Who knows what they do now? I don't know. Um, would do all these college nights and would visit all the high schools. Well, they still go around, I think. Yeah, and then they still they have do. more on campus now than yeah. what they did. Yeah, maybe. They, they, were, they would do that, but the, the first year I was there, you would, the protocol was that you were to go to visit the principal first and then go to the guidance counselor. Well, within a year or so, we weren't doing that anymore. Principals didn't want to see us. They would say, well, you know, nice to meet you, but counselors down there, you know, go talk with them. They're so the ones that have the one -on -one That's the right. That's right. And principals were busy doing other things. And so, so that kind of already was changing. Um, and then again, as, as we, you know, we started looking at black students or mainly black at that time, some Hispanic too, but mainly black, um, you know, that was changing things. Um, Anne and I were both, well, we weren't the guys. You know? I so we're asking questions and thinking a little differently than than they were. Than right. they were, uh, you know. We, I remember at one point when we were, they were. We changed the application a little bit every year, although it primarily stayed the same. But, but they used to have this whole big page and, and ask the student what activities they were in and all this stuff. And although that's fascinating to read, we were not making decisions based on that. And so we'd say, well, why do we? Why are we asking this? We're, we're not. We're not, not it we're not using it. We're not using it. We're not recording it. We're not putting it in the computer. We're not sending it to, you know, to engineering or liberal arts or anybody else. Why are we asking this? Oh well, um, That's yeah. It's been that way. Yeah, and so We've that. So after a year or so, a couple of years, that disappeared. Um, the other, Did they have computers in there at that time? Yeah, we had, they already had computers. In fact, at that point, Purdue was probably way ahead of everybody else. Okay. They're certainly not sophisticated the way they are now. Oh, yeah. But, but they, were still, the they, they were still, they were still, they were still, you know, they were still entering the applications in the computers and so on. Yeah, they, everything was right. still, again, not as much as it is today, right. but, but, um, they, Did you go in state or in out of state? Primarily in state. The only places that they went out of state at that stage was uh, usually up by Chicago mm -hmm. and maybe one or two places in in, in Ohio. So the Midwest. Yeah, area, but yeah. but primarily Chicago sure. and maybe a few in Ohio. But otherwise, it was all Indiana. Right. Um, by the time I left, you know, thirty years later, I was up in Michigan. I was in California. You know, we were kind of right. all over. Did they have, um, in those days, did they have day on campus like they have in the They summer? had day, um, Sterling Shaw had started day on oh, campus. Okay. And one of the things that... So that started around the 70s then? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. The well, it would be in the 60s probably, because oh, it, it was going, because it was going when okay. I was there. Now that they've changed the name of student yeah, access or that, something, yeah. and there's too many about four words and... Yeah, know. I know, I thought the same thing <laughs> when I read in the paper. Um, but yeah, I took that program over. I mean, Sterling had set it up. I didn't set it up. But, but I ran that program for a number of years then before I left. Um, it's a good program. It is a good program. Uh, it is a good program. And uh, then you get, uh, and they, they remember you because after you uh, see the engineering did it, and then mm -hmm. they would go over to ENAD and interview the students yes, and get them all yes, set, and, and yep. they remember them. And then they teach Engineering 100, yeah. and when they graduate, they, they, they remember. Yeah. Because yeah. you're just one of many, because that room was built uh -huh. on yeah. one twenty nine. Yes. I, I, see, and I used to, when I was running the program, I used to go visit every one of them, try to get to every school every sure. summer. Right. So I would know what was, kind of what was going on in those general meetings. Right, yeah. Yeah. So I used to hear Jim make his presentations, or Dick later on. But, yeah, that's right. But, yeah, they, uh, they were talking about that uh, yeah. recently because they did it together as a team for a yeah. number, yeah. number of uh -huh. years. You know? Yeah, yeah, used to do that. Um, one of the other things that happened, um, not, o not only was Purdue primarily male as far as admissions until Ann and I got there and then later Pat Moore after a year or so, um, but almost all the rest of the schools were basically men in the admissions office too. I don't think it was a plot to do anything. It just just happened. Just, it happened. just came up. Just the same way right? most of the principals were men. You know, sure, exactly. just happened. Um, but they used to have what they called a retreat in the spring and and talk. It's what the schools would have a retreat? Yeah, or? like Purdue and Ball State and IU and oh, all the colleges would. The universities. The universities would get together and sure. and 
camaraderie as much as anything, but um, play golf and talk about what they perceived as issues or things needed to deal with or so how you can cooperate or whatever. Right. Well, it was it always been male and and I challenged Charlie. Charlie was director at that point. Harlan had retired and I said, Charlie, you can't do this. You can't take because I can't go. He says, do you want to go? I said, that's not the issue. I can't. You know, I'm a woman. I can't go to this. And that's not, you know, that's not fair. And I said, if if you don't allow us to go, I said, I'm, and John Hicks was, it must have been the year that Hicks was president. When he was the interim. When he was the interim. Because be, I, I, because I remember saying to Charlie, I'm gonna, I will write a letter to Hicks and protest the fact that the university is paying for something that I, as a staff person, cannot go to. And he said, uh, uh, or, uh, and, I, and, and I could care less. I don't play golf. I, you know, that wasn't the issue as far as I was concerned. It was just the, the idea that you the, the guys are. He said, well, sometimes the men need to get away. And talk things over. I said, so do the women. <laughs> yeah. We have things to talk well, that's about. That's right, you know. <laughs> and we should not be excluded. And so I I had the letter written. I mean, I hadn't done anything with it. And that afternoon, Charlie came in. He says, we won't go. So they didn't go that year. And the next year, we went. We went. Yeah. Now, I thought it was you know, one of the most boring things to go to. But you needed to be there. That was not the idea at all. That was not the issue. That was not the issue at all. I, I think Charlie finally figured that out. But uh, anyway, but so, but yeah, that was my that was my one thing for women's lib. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Whatever. But yeah. you know, but with just the idea that it had always been a male thing, partly because they were all men working in those areas. Right. There weren't women there weren't in those. Any women there weren't women. Well, there were, but they weren't at the professional. Level. No, that no, right. not at the professional Sales. levels. No, yeah. as uh -huh. you said earlier. Yeah, yeah, they were there in the office, yeah. but they weren't doing that. What about the impact of technology? Did that enhance the operation in there? When oh the yeah, Be you know you could handle a lot more applications, uh, and you could. The decision was really never computerized, you know, in, in that sense, but it could figure out the probabilities and the all those statistical kind of things so that when you looked at the application you had these summaries of the grades and the high school rank that stuff was all figured you didn't have to figure any of that by sure. hand or anything yeah. uh, so that part was all done and once you admitted the student you know the, the record would we didn't ever send the physical files to the schools but but they got all that stuff right electronically they, so they would have yeah. I remember in engineering they would have a copy so they yeah. would already know what your GPA and what, yeah, you, what, you, what you've already taken yes, right. and what you may need to exactly. uh, test out of or exactly whatever. exactly so that all of that was all that calculations yeah. had been done all those said. were all done yeah right. yeah uh, the admissions for the researchers I'm thinking the applications would come to you and then you review the admissions office and then they're sent out to the school or did some of them go to the schools how did, no we we it, the way undergraduate admissions worked at Purdue, and I think it still does, the schools had all given the admissions office, said this is the kind of student, or this, these are the requirements that we say, you administer them. So they didn't ever see the, app, the applications. Okay. So the, they, the uh, pre what was required for admission what the, uh, was set up by the schools. Right, the they, they the set that had... stuff up, sure. were technically the Board of Trustees, but they would set it up and then we would just administer it, so they didn't see them. Right. I, they may on occasion have come over and said, you know, I got this phone call from Dad or something. And, right, sometimes you they, know, they have to have a look. Yeah. yeah, but that was that was right. extremely rare, extremely yeah. and rare. And they used to have li the uh, the lines used to be long, didn't they, at one time or not? Well, when when I was here, um, they were pretty much registering by, you know, the, they didn't have long lines they here didn't. when yeah. I was registering yeah. anyway. Must have been earlier yeah. Than that. So there were some then long lines of Michigan. Then you got to uh, associate. Associate. Tell us about that. What changes that brought to you? Well, you know, as there were a couple changes of directors, um, death and so on, retirements and so on, um, changes. Um, and so when Bill Murray became director, then I became an associate director, and Pat did, and 
well, Dave Councilman was there, I guess, at that time, and Dave. And we still didn't, it still was pretty much a flat, you know, we didn't, it wasn't um, very dictatorial or whatever. Sure. Uh, it was still pretty flat. Um, I think my, uh, you know, Bill always kind of laughed. But my PhD never made a bit of difference in the office as far as, you know, every, I think almost everybody had, I think everybody had a master's degree anyway. My PhD didn't make any difference, but Bill always laughed because he said it probably gave us admissions off a little more credibility in the academic <laughs> side of Purdue, you know, to have somebody there with a PhD. <laughs> but it didn't make a bit of difference as right. to what you were I doing know. or anything. It looks, it's nice. Yeah, that yeah, sort of thing, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you, you were in, uh, I mean, in the department, were you on any university committees while you were there? Um, I chaired the orientation Committee. Is that the university orientation? Uh -huh. Tell us what that was like. But now, I you know technically I wasn't a member of the Senate or anything, sure. uh, whatever. But I did chair the orientation committee, and they this and would this, be for incoming students. Uh -huh. Okay. And the and the the university would set, would nominate or or point, I guess, really appoint two or three people. So I'd have two or three faculty people come. Um, Orientation had started out, I think, being part of Dean of Students, and then it got transferred to our office. But like Betty Nelson and I would co-chair the committee and uh, for a while, and then mm -hmm. you know, and then eventually, I guess, the admissions office really took it all over. But there was always somebody from the Dean of Students sure. office on it. But um, and then there would be two or three faculty people and two or three students. The student government would appoint sure. some some students to be on it. Um, but but there was no budget, you know. So it was a committee. <laughs> yeah, it was a committee. It's called approval, but not funded. Uh -huh, right, the that's right. <laughs> and about the only thing that that we well historically, what had happened was that the president spoke to the incoming freshmen that Sunday before classes. before classes began. Well, we continued that eventually, because uh, again we didn't have any money to do anything. Eventually, we. Um, we got the schools to do like a an opening orientation session, usually on Saturday, Saturday or Sunday, depending. I can't remember how we worked that out. I've forgotten the timing on that, but but that weekend anyway. So the engineering would have some kind of a session with their kids. It might have been a picnic or something, but they would do something to kind of get them. With the residence hall? The residence, hall would residence halls so do things. things. They've been doing ROTC that. would do something. Sure. There were still chances to take placement tests and, you know, some of those kind of things. The library would had one or two sessions. Sure. Uh, so there were those, so we got a little more things going, a few more things going. And then um, then we also did a we did a newsletter called Boiler Briefs, um, that we we started out with three issues in the fall of that freshman year and three more in the spring that the admissions office funded. Those were kind of fun to Yeah. Fun to what did you do in the, the mid-year? And also, the well, other, another part of that, what about um, the adult students? Were there many, was there any orientation? The uh, SPAN plan used to do oh, some. okay, so that was so ongoing. So that they, would, they had that, and then they would always have some, you know, one or two sessions of that that weekend, too. Now, everybody, of course, was invited to sure. hear the president. And then the residence halls got so that they would do a parade and the band. You know, we would do a parade, parade through the residence halls and then end up at the Hall of Music for the president. Um, uh, I used to work with Dave Levla, and it was and it was always interesting because it seemed like every time it would threaten rain, and he, I'd say, "You make up. You just look at the weather, Dave. If it's raining and you don't want to do it, up to you. <laughs> I'm not balls gonna, in your court. Yeah, balls in your court. I'm not going to make that decision. I'm not going to make that decision. You just and he was fine to work with. I mean, that was he was agreeable to that. Yeah. And most of the times they got the parade in. It wasn't a very long parade, obviously, but. Yeah. Uh, but it was just the idea. Of it was the idea, of just doing something, and to, and to try to get kids to come to that president's convocation. Right. Um, Were you involved in planning anything for the parents as part of orientation? Uh, for the we parents? didn't do anything at, at right before classes. We did have a parent session during day on campus. Oh, okay. okay. We always had a parent session then, uh, where okay. it was just parents and staff people, and it was basically just questions and answers. 
Um, Just like they were saying at the financial aid, there'd be a session yeah, on that. Yeah, uh -huh. right. yeah, yeah. But there would be residence halls and dean of students um, admissions, and excuse me, there was a fourth person can't remember who it was. It was not it wasn't financial aid. We didn't do financial aid on right. that one because that's changed. Yeah, three hundred and sixty degrees. I know that's really caught mm -hmm. on. They had yeah. corn. Uh, the corn they started out with corn camp, and right. then that became Boiler Gold Rush. Rush. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 <clears throat> yeah. And tell yeah. us a little bit about your work on the uh, Development Advisory Committee for the Library. Yeah. Um, well, I'd known Kathy Potter because I was on the advisory. Emily, Emily Mobley. Was yeah, the, the yeah. I, Kathy, who became development for libraries, had been in vet medicine, and I knew Kathy from vet medicine. So, so she had said, "Would I be on the library board?" I said. Sure. What you know? What do I know about this? But sure. Um, I so anyway, wide my experience. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so I ended up being on the library board with uh, with. Uh, How many years were you on there? Quite a while. Yeah, because initially they had no limits. Um, so whenever the board first started, I was on until I guess two thousand seven. Whenever so. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. My little clock says 2007, so I, I can easily remember that, right? Yeah. And, it, um, and you met, uh, would you meet twice a year or once a year? I was thinking we only met once a year. That may have been. But I may have, you know, because I was here, the same way I sometimes have had lunch with Judy, and, and I may have seen Kathy or something, because I'm because I'm physically here in town. Right, I don't. Yeah. I think we only met maybe once a year, though. And, you go I think and, then, was... and then the president's council. Yeah. And uh -huh. of that yeah. Sort. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you served under several presidents. Hubdy was the president when you came, and uh -huh. then Hanson, and Dr. Hicks and Dr. Waring. Uh -huh. Yeah. Quite different. Again, quite different personalities. Yes. President Hubdy was always the was always the president. Somebody asked me. I know at, at that at our meeting the board meeting last week, uh, Nancy Vonick said to me... Are you back on the board? Yeah, oh. as, a re, as an emeritus member. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Whatever. I, I think our oral history is not going to conflict with that. I don't think so. Um, anyway, they asked me to come back. Would they be an emeritus member? I said, sure. Because I figure I always say, you know, if I can't do it, I can't do it. They sure. don't depend on me like they do on... Of course, the board's gotten so much bigger. But Nancy Vonnegut asked me because the president was going to come and talk to the board, you know, right before the uh, dedication. She said, tell me what the protocol is. She says, I remember when I was at Purdue um, that when the president came in, everybody stood up. I said, they did that when Hupti was there, but I said, nobody's done it to any of the presidents since then. <laughs> so when, you know, President Cordova came, nobody stood, nobody stood up. Well, there may have been people standing up already because she was a little bit late, and I don't know if we were talking about anything or having coffee. I don't remember what we were doing right then, but um, but I said no. I said nobody does that. Nobody did it for Hanson, and nobody did it for Hicks, and nobody did it for Beering, and nobody did it for Jiski, and nobody does it for Cordova. It's which, just sort of it's yeah. done by the board uh -huh. or something. Yeah, else, yeah, 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 right. yeah. Um, Let's see. Um, well, when when. Um, some of your hobbies and special interests. What have you got? Anything special you'd like to share with us? Traveling, there I guess. Except, right. except, like I said, the I'm places a... I've not visited or I have visited, I want to go back. Yeah. You got a favorite one that you like that you? Or are you still? You know, I I been... I like every place we go. I like for different reasons, I right. guess. And and although I there's always more. I always think there's a lot more things I want to see in all these places. There's still so many places I haven't been at all that I really don't right. I don't have the desire to go back. Get the ones that have not been to right? Yes. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like I like to read too. I Okay. How about any awards or honors that you'd like to share with the researchers? Uh, and your professional associations when you were do you, are you still I uh that? not really very much. Okay. Um out of Michigan I was Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, and and education honorees, some of those things. Mm -hmm. um, um, I was um, for the Indiana Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers. I was president, and I did get one of their Distinguished Service Good. Awards. That's nice. Um, Do you still keep uh, in touch with your professional associations or get any of their newsletters? Or? The uh, 
IACRO, which is that one, admissions mm -hmm. and registrar people, they have they meet every well they all, everybody meets I guess every year. Mm -hmm. um, they always invite the past presidents to come back, but I haven't gone back. Now I look at the program, I think I don't know these people, and the people that I do know are like Betty Sudarth, whom I see, Bill Murray, whom I see, Tom Gunderson. They're you know the people that were on the staff here. You see, right. That I could see. I may not see them, but I certainly could. They're they're accessible. Yes, right. Yeah, and when I look at the other ones, it's like. <laughs> well, you experience. I think you experience that, and then some of the people we have that inside. You know the inside. Uh -huh. group. Yeah, yeah. And I know we have sent out to retirees, and it, it, you just sort of lose track. You lose track um, of the people because many of these people have been gone for fifteen or more yeah, years, yeah. and they don't. Recognize well, when them. I look, when I read that now and read the. You know, like the service awards. I only read like the thirty-year service and the twenty-five and twenty because anybody like I don't know who they are anyway. Right. I did have. Um, that comes in inside Purdue. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. The um, we we always had uh, graduate interns in the admissions office. Not always, I guess, but most every year we did. And some of those people, you know, I still do Christmas cards with and so on. But uh, one of the fellows. And gosh, it's got to be, well, it must be more than 20 years ago now because he's got a daughter that's graduating from Purdue. So anyway, and he wasn't, didn't have any, wasn't married at the time he left Purdue. Anyway, he's now registrar at Rose Hallman. And he's he calls me always on my birthday. And when he called last time, uh, he said, I, I really am going to get up here because her name is Katie, is graduating and and I've always said when I come to see her, I'm going to come see you too. Well, he finally did that this spring, and so we had a nice. You hadn't visit. seen him sometime. I hadn't seen him. Well, not since I retired, because I used to see him in professional groups. Oh sure. But in not since I retired in the last ten years, I haven't seen him. Um, and so, so he came. So we had a nice. That's nice. nice visit. His daughter just got. Well, at the time he was here, she had applied to vet school, but she hadn't heard. Well, then he emailed me that she was put on the wait list. Well, then he emailed me again a week later that she she made it, she made it in. So that's he was great. pretty excited yeah, too. That's, that's and nice. then the younger daughter is going to go to St. Louis University, but oh, okay. uh, but not no. going to Rose, huh? No, huh? no, <laughs> no. Neither one of them is going to went to Rose. But uh, when uh, what's your retirement activities? You want to share those? When did you retire from Purdue? Uh, well, it's been ten years ago now, I guess. Yeah. I think 10, 11, 10. Time, time, <laughs> time flies. Time. I don't know. You know, I yeah. I guess, like you know, I can look, if I look back at my Medicare card, I can tell, I guess. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did retire when I was 65, so. Um, but you like to travel. You I like to travel. Right. Yeah, I, uh, you know, this university place is a, uh, resident-driven community, so there's a residence council and a lot of committees and so on here. So for the first four years that, that we were here, um, I was secretary to the council, residence council, uh, and I chaired a couple committees, and now I'm on the, there's a foundation, University Place, residence foundation, not the Franciscan Sisters, but the University Place. Um, and I'm on that board of directors and so I do some things like that around here. I'm on the, I'm on technically I'm on the library committee, but I don't do much for them. But except put the coffee table books out every once in a while. Um, and then I'm on the. Uh, You've helped out with the. Uh, the, po the poster exchange. Poster exchange, yeah. yeah uh -huh. Which was started by well Barbara Our, Zellick, yeah, for yeah. the researchers who's a resident here. Yes. Which, who's retired from the yes. library, but she ran that for yes. a number yeah. of years. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So and that's she, very good. And also, it's expanded because you, uh, University Place, also has some of the prints, yes. the framed posters from the yes, uh, yes, uh -huh. e exchange. Yeah, them. yeah, and they're wonderful. Yeah, I yeah. love them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, yeah, and when they when they decorated this place, although they put pictures up, they're pretty few and far between. And so we have worked hard. The posters have filled in a lot. Sure. Uh, and it, it, it enhances it. Well, and it, and they we can change them, right. you know, so that they, you don't have the same picture all the time. Not that people don't like the pictures that are there, but you know, you can move, the you move around. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, and then sometimes I wonder who picked that one. <laughs> we'll take a vote. Right? Yes. <laughs> um, 
so there are things like that. I'm on the the uh, board of advisory board for the Salvation Army. Um, I was on the West Side Library Friends board for a while. And are you still on that? No, no. Uh, okay. Uh, uh. That's kind of good. There were it was one period there where I think I was secretary of five organizations, and I said that is just asinine. <laughs> That's too much. <laughs> too much. I agree. Um, those are preservation archival collections. What's your thoughts on that for the twenty first century? And you you've been giving some materials to the uh, archives at Purdue, which is nice. Yeah, I said I I don't really have anything you know like Dick McDowell does as far as those kind of things to give. But but when I see some of these things that I think... You don't need them, but you know somebody who could right, benefit from That's by right. Them. I don't need them, and chances are they have not seen this. You right. know, I, I don't know if you know Alpha Taylor, who lives here. She said she had sent over some old needlework uh, magazine that had Amelia Earhart on it. And I said, now, see, and the Amelia Earhart people here wouldn't even know that magazine exists. Mm-hmm. Alpha is a needlework. She was one of the charter members of the Needlework Guild here in Lafayette and does absolutely gorgeous work. But she had this magazine, and here's Amelia on the cover of this magazine. I forgot what she said she was doing, so she'd sent that to Sammy. And she said, and I said, and you know, I said, they don't, they wouldn't even know to look for that because they don't know it's out there. It's just be a serendipity thing. And it's right, and it, it's and like one of the, she was on, I think, some good housekeeping or. Saturday evening, or one of those, but yeah. it's only be serendipity that somebody had it in their possession. Exactly, exactly. That, um, decided, well, I know that uh, uh-huh. the library has yeah. their hard collection, maybe they would want it, because I certainly don't need it anymore. Yeah, yeah, and that's what Alpha had done, and, that's, right, well, the, and there are a couple of things that I've sent like that, too, that I just, you know, it's like... Well, the, the thing that had to do with the astronauts, the yeah. newspaper things, and that's, you know, that's yeah. just great to have. Uh-huh. I mean, like yeah. first edition. Yeah, like, uh-huh. Mother and I used to try to get first editions when the stamps would come out. Well, and I wouldn't buy the boards. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How about yeah. a favorite? Do you have a Purdue tradition that's kind of a favorite that you'd like to share, or an outstanding event? I don't or know of anything in particular. Okay. What about uh, outstanding event in your life? It doesn't have to be at Purdue. It could be anything. That comes to mind. <laughs> Nothing comes to mind. <laughs> I need a pretty dull line. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, then I'll, I'll let you, uh, the boss in your court, and then some summary comments or closing or anything that you'd like to elaborate a little bit further on. I'll leave it up to you. Um, I don't know nothing in particular, I guess. I, I think I, I think at some point in my life I thought I would go back to Michigan, you know, after I retired. But that didn't make any sense anymore. My family, my parents were gone. I still have some friends up there, but... You know, they're my age, and... Uh, Do you still go to the football games? Did you ever? No, I did go to football games for a while, but now it's basketball and volleyball. Do you go to know. the men's and the women's? Or the women's? Uh, dropped the men's the last couple of years. Still go to the women's games and go to the volleyball games. That got to be kind of hectic. You, know, you were going all the time to some of those things as much. Now, and of course, they weren't winning when I stopped going. Now they're winning again. And I did go um, to four or five games this time because... Um, Virgil and Ruth St. John that live out in the houses here go to Arizona. So Virgil said, here, you want our tickets? I said, sure. You know, okay. You know, so that was an easy. <laughs> that was a nice offer. Yeah. Nice, uh-huh. As long as I can't use them. The That's right. Exactly. So so Mary Helen Zink and I went to, I don't know, four or five games in South Are there, um, the residents out here, there are quite a percentage of Purdue people, would you say? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I've never tried to. I mean, I guess if I looked at the, you know, the roles, sure. I could probably You're figure it out. Things, right. But uh, it, it may be half and half. I don't know. There, a lot of people think it's all Purdue, and it's not. I mean, there, when you, when I look around, I think, well, that's not a Purdue person. That's not a Purdue. Now they may have a, a Purdue connection. You know, they may have a son or daughter that's on the staff. But different than. Somebody but that's that different than somebody who actually was. Actually was, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Yeah. Like you know, I don't. You probably know Larry DeBoer. Junior, well, his parents live here. Well, they didn't go to Purdue, you know. They're they were out east. Well, from from the west, but worked out east at, in New York. And they're here in town because Larry Junior was here, and you know. So they've got that Purdue connection, but it's not right. the same way. Um, like yourself. Yeah, the same way um, uh, Dave and Florence Bingham, their daughter is married to. The golf coach. Well, they're not Purdue people. 
but they have a really but a they've time. got that connection sure. right so so there are there are connections like that but they're not really Purdue right people yeah. I mean they're they are but they're not you know right the connection is a little relationship is a little bit different yes uh-huh. right. yeah. yeah any closing anything I think that I can think of offhand. Barbara, I want to thank you very much for this interview. It was very nice. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure.